still one or two people just joining us, so we'll just give it a few more seconds. Well, there we are. I think most people are with us now. Uh, a very warm welcome to you to this first of um, DDU's eRemedies webinars. Um, I'm John Makin, one of the dental legal advisors here at DDU. And I'm grateful to you for joining us this morning. This morning we're going to talk about complaints. Um, it's one of the things that our members contact us most about, so obviously a very, very important topic. Um, and we hope you'll enjoy the uh, webinar format and be able to use it going forward as a part of your balanced CPD portfolio. I'm aware that we have a number of members of the dental team with us this morning, and, and very welcome you are too. Um, and I think as we go through the presentation, what everyone can do in their own role is identify uh, the things that are relevant to them and where they can contribute to the process and to good complaints handling. Um, going forward, this webinar will be available on DDU's website, so um, if colleagues want to use it for further team training and to promote debate and discussion within the team, then it will be available um, for that purpose too. We want to make this uh, as interactive as we can and therefore we invite your questions, comments and input um, along, along the way and um, in order to do that if you kindly use the chat box you'll see that identified by the red arrow on your screen um, and we can take questions as we go along and or at the end as well. Um, in case of any, any particular case specific questions then obviously you can contact me or one of my dental legal advisor um, colleagues via our, uh, our advice line if it's a, a particular patient specific question. So I, I'm going to leave you now um, in, in view. I'm going to switch to the presentation itself. So over to the presentation. So the intention here is, is very much to make this a, a, a positive presentation um, and we're going to um, have a, a practical risk management session um, and we're looking for really for tips and ideas that are going to help us to get things right as we go along. We're going to cover the general principles of complaint management rather than the very minutiae of the regulations. Um, you know, if you want to look on the DDU website, all the fine detail is there for you in abundance. And of course, if you do contact us on a particular matter via the, uh, the helpline or the advice line, then obviously we can give you specific advice. And, and it goes without saying that each dental legal advisor who's dealing with um, one of our members on a particular matter will be giving them bespoke advice um, as part of the assistance. Now, I think we can start off by, by sort of busting a little bit of a myth, actually. Um, and it, although complaints are on the increase, um, people tend to feel that patients are very ready to complain. And our general experience is that that isn't necessarily the case. Um, dentistry and the service that we provide is a very, a very personal subject, a very personal matter. And by and large, patients are really quite reluctant to complain. Um, and what we need to do is look at the things that actually um, might prompt them to do so. I think, I think we can be very positive about the number of patient interactions that we have and the proportion of complaints that we have um, relative to those. So I think that's a very positive thought um, as we set out on this. But clearly, <clears throat> any one complaint is of concern to us and we very much want to, to minimize those as, as we go along. Patients, by and large, think we as a profession are trustworthy, and particularly as individuals, everyone will say, oh, my dentist is, is really great, and that's, of course, why they're so reluctant to see others when, when people go on leave, etc. Um, the problem with that is that, that with that, that sort of deference goes trust. Um, patients tend to trust us, and if they believe that that trust has been in, in any way breached, then obviously that can give rise to, um, to concerns and complaints. So we need to be very mindful of that and guard that very carefully. Um, often, um, very underlying complaints are, are very minor 
um, little factors such as you know perceived rudeness, delays, apathy, etc., which collectively and cumulatively can give the patient an overall perception of the service that we're offering. Patients can't necessarily judge um, the dentistry that we do all the time, but they will certainly um, make judgments about the service we're offering, and perception is reality. Um, so we need to be mindful of those little underlying factors um, that can give, give rise to complaints um, at, at the earliest stages. So why is it important that we get it right? Well, clearly um, the key thing is that an early resolution is going to be really important. We want to cut matters down at the, at the earliest level because in that way we're going to limit collateral damage. We're going to limit um, how far the, the matter goes and, and who becomes involved. We're going to limit stress for everyone and time, time consumed by this. Um, we're also going to look at really what is a complaint this might seem very obvious and um, but as we'll see later on it's not quite so obvious as we might actually think and we'll explore in some detail what what really is um, a complaint and what when when to recognize one really um, responding um, it, it it's easy to get that wrong um, and particularly if we're naturally we're often upset to have received a complaint quite often it's the very patient who we feel we've gone the extra mile for um, and a, a, an immediate ill-considered response can be really quite negative um, and it's important therefore to think it through. Um, equally, the sort of head in the sand, ignore it and it'll go away approach um, is equally dangerous and equally damaging in the long term. Um, and finally, we're going to look and, and obviously most importantly at how we can avoid complaints. Something we'll consider as we wrap up at the end but you'll see that that's a thread of, of things that we uh, we consider right the way through as we as we go. So, looking at the complaints, I've already said that um, you know I, I think overall we're we're pretty good at, at managing them and avoiding them. Sadly, they are on the increase, and DDU was notified of somewhere pushing 4,000 complaints in 2013-14. Um, it's probably gone uh, beyond that now, and we can broadly divide these into two categories. Um, what, what I would describe as clinical treatment, obviously it's a very hands-on service that we, that we deliver to our patients, unlike some other professions. Um, and, and the other things, the service issues, the front of house type um, issues, unrelated necessarily to treatment, but that can and do still give rise to, to complaints. Um, so, just as an initial thought, um, we're going to invite you via the poll to give us an indication of, of how you think that these are actually divided up. And the question I think we're going to ask you is, what proportion of the complaints um, actually relate to non-clinical or service issues? Um, so if you go to the poll and, and do your voting now, um, and then we'll have a look and see how you get along with, with that proportion. I can see you're voting now. The votes are coming in. It sounds a bit like Eurovision, but I can see that all happening now. I think we're pretty much there now. So we can now share with you um, the results of that, uh, of that little poll. Um, the reality is that two-thirds of complaints actually do relate to clinical treatment and therefore by a process of deduction one-third relate to service issues and by and large um, actually a number of you overestimated the proportion that relate to service issues. I don't think you're particularly wrong in doing that um, because almost by definition there's often a combination of the two and that's something that will explore as we go along because sometimes those little disgruntlements as I would call them at an early stage can actually then be precipitated um, by a clinical incident so patients who are dissatisfied with timekeeping and appointment issues and um, general communication from the practice the sort of front of house type stuff 
um, a clinical incident then, all those things have been saved up um, and a clinical incident can then precipitate um, and trigger uh, a complaint that really relates to those um, issues. Um, so why is it important that we get this right? Well, number one, and very obviously, um, we have a GDC obligation as registrants um, to have a complaints policy. Um, those of us with um, NHS or health board contracts um, also have that contractual obligation as well. But as professional people, we would expect to deal with and address people's complaints in a proper and timely manner. Um, if you look at the GDC standards for the dental team, uh, section 5 addresses this and you'll see that it's really quite prescriptive um, in terms of how we should deal with complaints and, and the process that we should address and if you haven't already looked at that I'd certainly commend that to you and um, as, as part of your team training on complaints handling do have a look at the provisions of um, standards section 5. I think you'd be quite surprised as to how prescriptive that really is. The other thing is that, um, and it's not in that list there, but it's, it's hugely important in my view, is that really it, it, it's a business benefit. Um, if you think of um, maybe a retailer who you would identify as, as having a good customer service approach, um, and, and generally people tend to think of one particular one and you'll all be thinking of your own but if you think about that they really crave our feedback they want to know how we've done they want to know if we're unhappy in any way and the reason for that is, is fairly obvious that they're seeking to improve their service over and above their competitors and I think it's really important that we're mindful of that and we make it comparatively easy for patients to complain if they want to and it's very easy to hide the complaints process under the reception desk and hope that no one sees it other than the, the cleaner when she's dusting or whatever but the reality is that commercial organizations have quite the opposite um, effect now I'm not for a moment suggesting that you go out and actively generate complaints as a, as a means of feedback there's a very different way of doing that and I'm not also suggesting that as you open your tenth complaint of the month you're going to go oh joy a bit more feedback um, but the principle is there if patients aren't complaining directly to us then the danger is that they're going to be complaining to someone else and we'll see in a moment um, where, where that might be um, so I think the key thing is to institute customer feedback in a controlled manner um, you'll all have different ways of doing that customer um, service um, feedback forms and the like um, and, and the other thing is obviously to act upon them when when we see them um, so you know statistically as well there's another good reason is that patients who've had their complaints well dealt with actually can become real advocates and ambassadors for the practice going forward um, they, they deem that customer service is an important part of, of, of the service that they receive and complaints handling be an integral part of that so actually if we deal with a complaint well patients will recognize that and consider that to be part of the service and they will tell others and they see that as an integral part of the organization sometimes because we are sort of you know very proud of what we do it, it's very easy to be affronted by receiving a complaint and um, feel that you know we should then dissuade the patient from ever coming to see us again and um, far from it and it actually again if you look at the GDC standards um, it specifically says that we shouldn't decline to see a patient just because they've made a complaint now as we all know there may be circumstances where the, the, mat, the facts of the matter may be indicative that there's been a breakdown in the dentist patient relationship um, and that's something that should be addressed. If we look at 1.7.8 in the standards, that very clearly specifies how we should um, end the, the professional relationship with a patient in the event that there has been a breakdown. Um, but that needs to be very, very carefully handled, and I would suggest that you always give us a call about if you're ever considering such a thing, um, because that can of itself precipitate a complaint. 
And I would suggest that um, we always deal with the complaint first and then deal with who's going to see the patient or if at all as a separate matter and separate the two because as I say the GDC does take a dim view of us um, declining to see patients on that basis. You see at the bottom there it said the spectre of double jeopardy and multiple jeopardy indeed and what we mean by that is that a simple clinical complaint, uh, clinical matter say, can give rise to a complaint under the NHS complaints procedure which as we all know we would seek to address under local resolution arrangements um, and that's fine and, and, and that's, that's the way we should do it and we should try and close that down at a local level and we'll talk about the ways in which we might do that. If unfortunately local resolution does fail and as we'll see later on then we should signpost our NHS patient to the um, to the ombudsman um, such that you know they, they can raise their concerns there if they're unhappy. Similarly with a private complaints procedure there should be another bullet there that ideally that says local resolution because of course we would seek to deal with that locally first but again ultimately if local resolution um, fails despite all our best efforts then patients are entitled to go to the dental complaint service. Indeed, sometimes they'll go directly to the dental complaint service and the first that you'll hear is that then the DCS might give you a call to say that they've received um, concerns from a patient. By and large they're very helpful and um, they don't take sides and they, they seek uh, to, to provide a sort of conciliatory approach um, and um, often their input can be, can be helpful. Going on, um, matters that are raised by patients and complaints can give rise to disciplinary matters, performance assessment, performance list type issues, um, sometimes um, precipitating a wider trawl of records by the health board um, and ultimately if there are concerns flowing from that a referral to the GDC and again that's that really important reason for local resolution. Increasingly and unfortunately complainants are, are going directly to the GDC. Now as you'll be aware, um, this is something that we at DDU are uh, particularly concerned about and it's something that we're raising, we're very keen for the, um, you've probably read about the Section 60 orders etc such that the GDC can amend its processes but at the moment we are where we are and if the GDC receives a complaint from a patient then it's obliged to investigate and again um, it's not the purpose of today to go into GDC matters in detail but ultimately um, it, it can be a protracted and very stressful process ultimately uh, with the possibility of conditions or even erasure in, the, in extreme cases um, and, and it's a process we really don't want to get involved in if we can. So again this is something we want to avoid by good complaints handling um, at the most local level. Again, patients clearly, um, if they feel they've suffered harm, may seek a remedy in, in negligence, so they may bring a negligence claim against us, very unusually, but possibly uh, criminal matters may be involved, for example, if a patient alleges an assault or an improper touching or, or whatever, um, and occasionally the procurator fiscal may be involved in, in the event that a patient's died and, for example, um, you know, the, the cause of death is something like dental sepsis or, or, or as it does happen occasionally um, and, and occasionally that can be involved and you would seek our support and our advice in, in dealing with that. So going forward, um, here we are, quite happy in our, in our surgeries, in our practice, minding our own business, working hard, um, you know, the, the enamel face so to speak and uh, you know, up, up pops the GDC principles um, on our wall and um, I won't ask any of you to, uh, to to flag up whether it's there or not and I can't see your blushes via via this medium so, so you're quite safe and you're okay but in reality is that the GDC standards do require that, that we do display it and you'll see that the word should is there um, throughout the GDC standards and, and in the preamble it defines um, the difference between must and should. Um, must means must 
and should means must other than in exceptional circumstances. Now I don't know about you but I can't imagine exceptional circumstances where one couldn't display such a poster other than perhaps a, a world drawing pin shortage or something like that. So I'm afraid we're, we're stuck with this on our, on our walls. Um, and if you look, obviously number five there um, does require that we have a clear and effective complaints procedure and patients are aware of it. And believe you me, um, patients are aware of, of these um, principles and how we should be operating and they're starting to quote them back to us in their complaints, almost verbatim. So as well as obviously accessing these via this poster on our wall, they, they can access it uh, via the web as well. So what is a complaint? We might think it's very, very obvious, but a, a pretty simple definition is, is this one, an expression of dissatisfaction that requires a response. Now, importantly f for me and, and in the work that I do um, in the day job, so to speak, is, is not just what this says, but what it doesn't say. Um, and, it, and it doesn't say a written expression of dissatisfaction that requires a response. And very often, um, colleagues will, will make a, a mistake of thinking that a verbal complaint either isn't valid or isn't a formal complaint as such. Um, and beyond that, um, sometimes we'll encourage patients to actually put things in writing. Now, patients are perfectly entitled to make a verbal complaint. It's entirely valid. And, and one of the reasons being, of course, that some patients are illiterate. So to actually deprive them of their right to complain simply because they can't put it in writing wouldn't be considered to be acceptable. Complaints often, and as we'll know, patients very often will come and see us in practice and won't say anything in the surgery, but they'll go out to reception um, and, and the poor old receptionist or practice manager um, gets, gets both barrels really. Um, or it's even more subtle than, than that. Now I think it's really important to recognize that. And it's really important that frontline staff are trained and empowered to either deal with matters at, if they're at a very low level, but as an absolute minimum to raise the issues with the treating clinician. Sometimes um, our reception colleagues feel that they don't want to upset us, don't want to offend us, etc. But I think it's very important that we say, look, you know, even the most minor um, element of dissatisfaction, please do tell me. And the reason for that is that when the patient next comes in, let's say, for example, the patient says, well, I don't know why I need a, a crown. I thought I could have a filling on that tooth. Um, if that's fed back to the dentist, next time the patient comes in, you know, you can say, look, can I just run through what we covered last time? Let me re-explain, etc." And sometimes you can disarm a complaint that the patient doesn't even know they're making yet. And if you remember at the outset, we said that sometimes very minor little points can have a cumulative effect um, and can actually add up. So by disarming them at that very early stage. And sometimes, obviously, our complaints procedure needs to be invoked. Um, and again, every member of the team has a really key and important role within that process. So everyone needs to be on board, everyone needs to know how it works and as I said you can as we go along identify where you can contribute to that. Sometimes a very simple honest response on the spot, you know I'm sorry I've kept you waiting, um, a patient comes in, we are running behind, um, you know don't be um, um, sort of um, how can I put it, uh, imaginative with the waiting time, be realistic, give patients the option to rebook or whatever. There's nothing aggravates them more to be um, kept waiting. Simple little things can add up. Um, I would suggest one thing that's quite useful is, um, for those of you who are practice owners, when you have a week off, ring your own practice on a Monday morning and see how easy it is to get through. Um, and, and then you know equate that with your experience of call centers etc and sometimes very simple things can, can um, mean that patients are rather happy with the service. Sometimes a particular major issue requires our investigation and obviously as part of the complaints procedure that's one of the stages and one of the processes but sometimes very little a combo of little mini 
um, events fed back to us by our staff who are picking up on this. So they have their radar pinging for low level disgruntlement, um, can come through and we can investigate that and make changes and improvements. So one of the key things is how do we respond? Um, what do we think complainants actually want? Um, so this is where we wake you back up again. So over to you, um, again using your uh, chat box, um, the red arrow there, um, if you feed back to us and let us know uh, the things that you think patients or complainants actually want from us and the reasons why they're complaining. Just give you a couple of minutes to do that. Thank you, Kate. Kate's saying an apology, and um, certainly that that's one of them, if um, if that's relevant. One or two others coming in. Uh, money back uh, it can be the case. But it'd be a surprising number of people who who aren't particularly interested in the money side of it. Patients are actually quite altruistic, and as one colleague's um, just said here. Sometimes they, they don't want the same thing to happen to somebody else. Um, that's particularly the case when um, it's a matter of confidentiality. Often patients over here a breach of confidentiality. It might not be about their, uh, their information, but, but sometimes um, they, they perceive that it may happen to them, so patients are quite altruistic. Um, recognition of the issue and reassurance. Thank you, George. Um, absolutely. So. Um, you know, not not you know, sort of pretending that there's nothing there, and sometimes it is reassurance. Sometimes it's just a, a re-explanation. So we've got a number of the the key issues there um, from colleagues um, emailing in. Um, but that, absolutely, patients are looking for an explanation. Um, they know, they want to know what's gone on there, why it's happened, and sometimes the explanation is is the solution because sometimes people have simply misinterpreted or misunderstood um, what, what's, what's been going on there. Um, sometimes they just want to vocalize how they feel, they don't want to take it any further but they just want to, to, to vent their spleen so to speak and that's where the um, listening skills are absolutely crucial. Um, so th there's a real technique to, um, to sort of sitting back letting people have their say and some of the communication courses you'll go on um, with, will help you with that. On that point actually, um, if you look at the foundation training curriculum and um, the revalidation curriculum that the GDC proposed before it went on the back burner, um, only one quarter of that curriculum is, is, is clinical. The rest is communication, leadership and management and professionalism. Um, and I think when we do our CPD we should address all of those issues. Um, there we are. Um, Kate was quite right there. We, we certainly, um, patients have an apology if, if it's merited. Um, generally speaking, it, it, we can say sorry um, and it doesn't mean an admission of liability or anything like that. It just means I'm sorry you're unhappy with the service. Um, you know, I'm sorry we kept you waiting or if there is a particular issue then obviously we can apologize but no one sets out in the morning thinking, I'm going to generate some complaints and aggravate a few patients. Um, so, you know, we are genuinely sorry if, if our service hasn't matched up to patients' expectations. Um, sometimes um, patients want remedial treatment, they just want it fixing. You know, it's like if you take your car to the garage, it has a service and it comes out rattling. You, you take it back and you want them to sort of, you know, screw it back together in such a fashion that it's not going to rattle anymore. Patients don't necessarily want their pound of flesh, they just want it fixing and they want an equitable solution um, in, in respect to the cost. Sometimes improvements to the service, um, they might be particularly the non-clinical um, matters um, and again we can feed back to patients how, how we've addressed those. Um, Sometimes it's a perceived wrong and sometimes, of course, we'll explain to patients following our investigation that everything's been, been dealt with, but just our approach to it can show sometimes that we would be willing to address um, any, any issues in the event that they were there. And it's their complaint, if they're complaining directly to us, 
um, then they should be fully involved in the process and, and we engage with them on, on a personal level. Um, and importantly, and again, very important in stopping matters escalating, um, it's important that from the outset they understand the process. So often when we send our acknowledgement um, letter, we'll be saying to the patient, look, you know, here's a copy of the complaints procedure. Sorry, you, you're unhappy. Um, but, you know, this is how we'll be dealing with it. And then obviously it's important that when we do that, then we stick to that. Um, you know, if we've got time frames for a response and, for example, we need to seek some records from somewhere else or whatever, then keep the patient in the loop, send them a courtesy letter to say, sorry, it's taken a bit longer than anticipated, um, but we, you know, it is important to us and we are um, addressing it. Um, the way not to deal with it is, is you know, denial and trivialization. Um, you know, no one else has ever complained, so how can you possibly be right? You know, that sort of approach. Um, because that can actually, um, you know, lead to an escalation um, going forward, and that's the last thing we want. So we need um, an insight in, into that. Um, we don't want to be blaming the patient. Um, oh, well, you, you know, should have used the furry end of the toothbrush or whatever, or, you know, you shouldn't have cancelled so many appointments. Um, we need to address the issues that the patient's raising. Some of those issues we might be uh, gently reminding them of in responding, um, but it's not, not seeking to blame the patient and or others. Um, we need to address any issues relating to ourselves. And again, um, excuses um, that, that avoid the issue or don't deal with it. It's very important to realize that our initial response, and this is why you know, respond in haste and repent at your leisure is, is very apposite. Um, our initial response can come up later on in the event that matters are escalated. And if we're seen to um, try and pull the wool over a patient's eyes if something's gone wrong or whatever, then that can be seen as very negative on two fronts. One is it can be seen that we're trying to mislead the patient, which can question our probity and our honesty, which is obviously, as professional people, extremely important. And, and the other thing is, it, it could also suggest that we lack insight into the issues that the complaint raises, which, again, going forward, might give rise to fitness to practice questions. So it's far better to acknowledge that something might not have gone very well and try and find a solution and deal with it than try and sort of, you know, head in the sand um, and, and, and bury the thing because that can come back to sort of bite us later on. Um, people don't want to be felt that, you know, feel that things have been kicked into the long grass. Um, there are necessarily some stages and that's why we should tell them about that from the outset. But it's really important that, that we, they don't believe that we're, um, you know, just burying the thing because, again, that can give rise to them feeling the need to escalate it because they think we're not addressing it um, properly. And finally, um, a jargon for letter. The patient needs to understand the complaint, um, and particularly if a complaint relates to a miscommunication and a misunderstanding of something, if we go on and send them a jargon for letter that they don't understand, then that just perpetuates it. And, potentially suggests that um, there's a jolly good reason why they didn't understand in the first place because we weren't able to um, to explain things in, a, in, in, a, in an understandable fashion for them. So moving forward, how, how do we respond? What are the best ways for us to respond? Well, a number of, of key pointers. Um, the first thing is to be empathetic. Uh, um, you know, it, it doesn't hurt us to say, you know, I'm sorry that to learn that you had such a difficult weekend with that endo that blew up. That must have been really unpleasant for you and really difficult. That's not you know, admitting any liability. It simply puts yourself in their shoes um, and shows that you've got an element of understanding and empathy which is important for anything. And surveys have shown that patients really value that. Um, a key thing is do involve us at the very earliest stage because sometimes we, we approach these things, we start with the end in mind, so to speak, and we can see from our experience where these things might go, and sometimes we can flag up some pitfalls for you um, along the way and help you to respond carefully 
um, at a very early stage. Um, again, as we said in the last little section, um, you know, we can say, you know, I'm sorry the outcome wasn't as you or I would have wished, um, and if it's appropriate, apologise if outcomes weren't as expected. Um, it doesn't ever benefit us to try and blame others. Um, and, you know, ultimately sometimes the, the, the thing is just totally vexatious, and um, in those circumstances you discuss it with us and we'll help you respond appropriately, but generally speaking, that sort of empathetic understanding response is going to keep things at the most local level as far as we can. Sometimes people contact us and, and you know, particularly with that patient where you've really gone the extra mile and, and you know, everything you've done, the patient's been unhappy with, etc. Sometimes you can't quite see the wood for the trees, and, and as well as not responding in haste, useful to, to float it by you know your peers or an independent colleague in the practice and and get a view from someone who's an objective view from someone who's not directly involved and that's useful and that helps us maintain our sanity sometimes in dealing with these things as well another thing is is that often these complaints will have multiple elements to them and it's important to you know go through that letter with a highlighted pen pick out the key um, points that the patient needs to address then if it's one to six make sure you don't miss out you know five and six from that list because as sure as eggs are eggs the patient will ignore the the key points you've made on one to four and think you're trying to be evasive on five and six so um, address all of the points even the even the uncomfortable ones um, again as I said patients are quite altruistic they, they want to feel that, that this isn't going to happen to others so sometimes we can learn from things um, and, and patients like to know that they've contributed to development for, for other patients and, and it's useful to, to say to them how that can be done. And often, again, it, you know, responding by email or by letter is a very um, sort of harsh medium sometimes and we can't express ourselves quite so well in print as we can in person. And given that you know we've often known these patients for a long time, it's really useful to to you know see the whites of each other's eyes and use our, our uh, sort of nonverbal skills as well to um, to uh, explain ourselves to our patients. Um, key thing not to do is 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 panic. It's very upsetting to receive any sort of complaint. And as I say, we can feel somewhat um, professionally affronted. Whatever you do don't go back and amend um, notes, it's so tempting to do that. Any amendment to a note should be um, you know, clearly dated, noted that it, it, it's a, a, a retrospective note, um, you know, clearly identified, because again, any attempt to amend a contemporaneous note can give rise to probity questions, fitness to practice and honesty issues, which are far more likely to be serious than the complaint itself so please do avoid that temptation um, don't be disparaging to colleagues um, quite often we'll, we'll, we'll hear uh, colleagues say look this patient's been somewhere else this colleague's obviously criticized me um, well don't necessarily take that at face value the patient may be either misinterpreting or misquoting what they've been told elsewhere um, and by the same token if you do see patients have been elsewhere uh, be circumspect in what you say. It's really important to be clear and transparent and honest with patients, but make sure that you don't criticise patient uh, colleagues unnecessarily, because you never know the uh, circumstances under which that treatment's been delivered. Don't attempt to respond without seeing the notes. Indeed, contact us any way other than the acknowledgement. And as we've said, um, a rapid response can sometimes. Um, be a, a very negative thing. Now what we're going to do, we're going to show you um, a scenario that you saw just flash before your very eyes there and we're going to invite your thoughts um, from, from the screen. Um, so this is a complaints scenario um, it has lots of elements in it and just as a sort of discussion point for us to illustrate some of the things that we've already discussed. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to read this one um, and jot down some of the points that you think that this uh, gives rise to. And I'll give you a hint, um, there aren't too many words in there that aren't there for a, for a, for a reason.
So how are we doing? Are you picking up on on those key points there now? So you want to send through when you're ready some of those issues that you think that that gives rise to. So it's highlighted that the patient's in pain. Obviously, that's a key factor that we need to consider. Sarah's asking, why did the receptionist ask him to write in? Well, that goes to one of the things we highlighted earlier, and we'll, we'll raise that matter shortly. Mark's highlighted the fact that the dentist has actually left the practice. Again, that could have some impact. Um, there's another one coming in. What's the issue in respect of his being 18? Well, yes, that was mean of me to make him an 18-year-old, I have to admit. And should this complaint have been passed on to a dentist? Okay, well, thank you for those um, points. Let, let's, let's work our way through this and look at some of the issues that it raises. Absolutely. So the complaint has come in via the practice manager and it's been raised by the patient's mother. So clearly, this is an 18-year-old patient, so already we've got an issue here that the complainant isn't the patient. So we've got an issue of confidentiality here, so how on earth would we deal with this? We want to be seen to deal with complaints, we want to address them at an early and a local level, but this one hasn't come from the patient. So two things we would probably do here, certainly we'd acknowledge the letter in the usual way, but we'd say to the, to the mother, as you'll understand, we have a duty to respect our patient's confidentiality and therefore we're not in a position to discuss um, any matters relating to, to um, a third party other than with that person's permission. So it may be that then the son would write in with his authority which would then give you um, authority to deal with his mother Alternatively, uh, and additionally, what we would do is we would contact the son and we would say, we understand uh, that there may be some concerns. Your mother's raised these with us. This is our understanding of what the issues are and we could address it then in, in that local resolution way. Um, it's a former associate of the practice. We'll sort of bear that in mind as we go through, but that's important. So the treating dentist who would address a clinical complaint is no longer in the practice. So that's important that we have a mechanism in place as to how we deal with that because clearly normally matters of a clinical nature would be addressed and forwarded on to the treating dentist. <clears throat> and as Sarah I think it was highlighted, um, this patient um, as well the mother indeed has contacted by telephone the receptionist and who has somewhat misguidedly insisted that she puts this in writing. Now as we said earlier, a verbal complaint is entirely valid. What should have happened here is the receptionist should have made a note of, of the concerns, um, obviously bearing in mind the confidentiality aspect and playing a sort of fairly straight bat in that regard. Um, but a note of the concerns such that that enables a response. So generally, a verbal complaint entirely valid, but that should um, come through, and then that can be forwarded. So we can easily respond to a verbal complaint. We can write back to the complainant and say, you know, um, sorry you, you're um, unhappy with the service we provided. My understanding of the concerns you raised with our practice manager are this, 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 and this. Please let me know if we've in any way misinterpreted that. And in that way, um, we can very easily um, cover that base. If, if we're wrong in that, the patient will come back to us and tell us, but at least they do so at a local level. Um, so again, this now, this treatment was provided there and then at that checkup appointment. Now, we all know that if it's something sort of fairly minimal, um, both in terms of efficiency, some patients would like us to get on and address that. But we need to be very careful in dealing with that. Um, GDC standards um, 2.1 actually requires 
that we give patients a treatment plan in advance of treatment. Um, and 2.3.6 says that we must give it in before their treatment starts. So we've got to be very careful of that. And there's a good reason, really, why that is. It, it gives them a cooling off period, if you like, time to go away, time to think about it, and time to ask any questions. Um, and um, therefore, it, it's an important part of the consent process. Consent being a process, a continuum and not an event. So sometimes, it, if patients are feeling anxious, nervous, they may feel a bit put upon at the time and feel that they didn't have adequate time to consider the advice that's been given. So clearly, it's slightly different in an emergency situation, but generally speaking, give patients time to go away, give them the necessary requisite paperwork, um, and give them the, the time to consider. In this case, we're rather on the back foot in dealing with this because of the way and the time frame within which the, the treatment has been um, delivered. And, and George raised that issue as a, as a consent issue um, quite rightly um, in that process. The issues in respect of um, you know, confidentiality and the embarrassment in front of the waiting room, they're issues for the practice to respond to, actually. So there might be a training issue, there might be a logistical issue with the, the arrangement, the geography of the practice. But in this situation, we might need a composite response. So we might need the treating dentist to respond in respect of the clinical issues, and we might need either um, a, a separate or, or an overarching letter, a covering letter, to go with that from the practice that addresses these service issues in terms of the perhaps the issue of the, um, the estimate in advance and or um, the receptionist um, and, and how she conducted herself or he conducted himself. We've now got a patient with a sensitive tooth and clearly any of the issues relating to the relationship between the practice and the associate should be put to one side and are very much secondary to dealing with our patient in pain. And it's very easy for those issues to override um, that, that sort of patient care issue. Um, for that reason, it's really important that agreements and arrangements are in place when, when associates or, or even partners move on, such that um, there's, a, there's a, a set arrangement as to how such matters will be dealt with. So sometimes, for example, um, and obviously we can't give you business or contractual advice in this regard, but there might be a set amount of, of funding set aside um, to deal with any urgent remedial treatment um, and then in that way the practice can just get on and deal with the problem without um, involving um, the associate at that stage and then deal with it later on once the patient's um, sorted out. And obviously that reflects in terms of the practice, the goodwill and the service that that's, um, you know, it has impact on. And therefore, it's very much in everyone's interest to, um, to, to make sure that such a circumstance is dealt with smoothly. So I, can, I think we can see that this sort of comparatively simple circumstance throws up a whole lot of issues um, in terms of how we handle complaints, how our practices are set up, the arrangements that we have um, between um, associates and the practice, etc. Um, and can give rise to, to all sorts of issues if we don't deal with them at, uh, at the appropriate level. Patients neither know or care what the arrangements are between the practice and the associate. They just want their remedy and they just want it sorted out. So the key thing is deal with those matters um, first and then sort other things out in the background relating to the, uh, the financial side of things. Um, so you've kindly sent your thoughts through and you've flagged up many of those issues um, that we raised there. Um, so just in summary, there's, there's a consent and a, and a confidentiality issue here. Does this patient consent to, this con to the complaint itself? Um, and we've talked about how we're going to deal with that. It's important that you not seem to be using this as a delaying tactic and um, you know, as, a, as a kick it into the long grass issue. Um, some mostly generally people do actually accept and understand that that's the position and and they recognize that you do have that duty 
and again it, it shows them that you're dealing with matters um, professionally. Um, so as, as we've said, the person who's been treated, obviously if it's an adult, can, can complain the cell. Um, someone on behalf of a patient, if it's an advocate, obviously the health board um, are legally obliged to have conciliators on board um, and in certain circumstances if the patient's died um, and the, obviously the executor would need to be involved. So even if someone's died, there's still a duty of confidentiality. Um, and again, you'd be talking to us in those circumstances, but that would be going through the executor. Um, and again, if it's a child, it's um, someone with parental authority, parental responsibility. And again, if there's incapacity, again, you'd probably be talking to us about that and we'll give you a steer. Um, the investigation, there are multiple elements to this complaint, as we've seen. And clearly the input of the treating dentist and, and the staff involved would be required. And we'd reflect that in the response. So our response might say something along the lines of, you know, um, Dr. Smith was the dentist who provided your treatment. And you'll see that attached to, to this overall letter is Dr. Smith's observations or, or are Dr. Smith's observations. And then, you know, you were concerned about the receptionist, I as the, um, as the um, practice um, manager, the uh, complaints officer, have spoken to the receptionist concern and X, Y, or Z. And, you know, we've agreed that she was overzealous or whatever it might be. Um, and then clearly that response would address the key issues. Um, hopefully we'd have dealt with the clinical point. We'd be highlighting the fact that, um, you know, we, we recognised that, that, that this was a concern and perhaps henceforth um, we would book a separate appointment or something of that nature. Um, and again, we would be saying that, you know, we've had some team training if needs be or whatever it is. So that patient might be happy that this isn't going to happen to someone else, the, the, the sort of confidentiality issue, etc. And if needs be, uh, uh, when, when matters would be re reviewed again. Um, so, on occasion, we do need to meet with a complainant, um, either as part of the process itself or, you know, as a follow-up to our letter of response. It's really important that in advance we agree what's going to happen. And so, if, if we possibly can, we have an agenda. Um, we don't want to book an hour's appointment and the patient turn up with um, 27 pages of A4 bullet points for the issues that they want to raise. Neither do we want either party to feel ambushed um, by matters being tabled. It's not good form to do that. And it's really important that we, um, we give everyone the opportunity to be clear as to the points that they want to raise and the issues that they want to discuss. So a clear agenda is really important. Um, patients, as we said right at the outset, they really don't like to complain if they can avoid it. And, um, Sometimes they'll feel very anxious about doing that. And sometimes, because obviously it's important that you have a witness to fact, for example, your practice manager or whoever with you, we don't want them to feel bullied or outnumbered either. So it's good that they bring someone along with them. Um, and generally matters are much less likely to become heated or out of hand if, if there are independent third parties there. So uh, a friend, an advocate, a conciliator from the health board, someone like that. Um, sometimes if it's a clinical matter, an independent clinical opinion can help. Um, if it, obviously it's someone from within the practice, the patient might question that. But sometimes if there's a, a senior colleague there, maybe even someone the patient's seen before and respects, um, that can be helpful as well to, to give a, a, a view on that. Um, do contact us in advance to prepare. Um, we can give you some bullet points. Sometimes it's good to, to, to make some bullet points, notes of the issues you want to discuss um, because it's very easy to lose, lose out on that in the heat of the moment. Um, so record and agree the minutes um, and then everyone knows where they stand. Sometimes people say, well, can I record and uh, make a sound recording of the meeting? And, and colleagues are very anxious about that. Um, I've got no particular issue with that. So long as it's transparent, um, both parties are given a copy and a transcript of it, um, it's far better that we know that's happening than it, than, than it happened covertly, for example. 
So once we've gone through this whole process, um, occasionally um, the patient will come back to us and say, well, look, that's all very well, but you know, on the way home I remembered I forgot to raise two matters. Um, and, and you know, if it, if that's the thing that puts the thing to bed, well, why not? You know, you might just cover those final two points. That's not to say we let patients go on and on and on about the same issues forever and a day when we feel we've addressed them. And occasionally, the the complaint you know needs to be signed off by the complaints manager and say, well, look, you know, I'm sorry, despite our best efforts, um, it, it, it appears we're not going to be able to resolve this at a local level. Um, you know, we can't enter into correspondence indefinitely. It's not not good for either party. Um, we'd indicate that formally, and in that circumstance, we'd we'd um, signpost them as as we're required to do to either the um, the ombudsman or to the dental complaint service um, as appropriate. Better that again than they go direct to the GDC, of course. Um, so, you know, those are the, the key things in respect of meetings. So, um, we've talked about a number of these issues as, as we've gone through, but clearly um, maintaining good communication throughout. Um, from the moment a patient contacts us, um, you know, even the information on our website says things about us and makes promises about our service you know, cosmetic dentists to the stars are marvellous with children, um, etc. And if we don't deliver that, then then that can be um, can be a, a problem. And our communication with patients is absolutely key. As I said, that's one of the four domains of foundation training. And it shouldn't just be for foundation training. It's really important as a as might be called one of the soft skills, but it's one of the fundamentally important skills as we go through our careers as an adjunct to our clinical skills and abilities. Um, we can't deliver our clinical skills if A, we can't communicate with patients, we, we don't gain valid consent and they don't understand what, what it is that we're suggesting. Managing patient expectations is absolutely key and fundamental. Um, there's a, an American business guru called Tom Peterson who's attributed with, with the quote which is under promise and over deliver. And, and I think that's a really important thing for us to do. Um, if we don't think we can make, meet patients' expectations, then it's really important to say so at the outset. Um, if we don't really understand what those expectations are, then it's difficult for us to meet them. So if we don't think we know what they are, then it's important to take a step back before we embark on treatment, particularly with things like cosmetics, etc., cetera, um, where, where it, it's... Um, you know, ill-defined um, sometimes what's in someone's head and what they anticipate. So those stages we go through are, are fundamentally important. Um, in terms of patient expectations, um, there's a there's a key difference between a reason and excuse, um, and and it's simply this: it's simply just time. Um, if we explain to a patient in advance when we look at the bite wings that this is a very deep cavity and We'll do our best to address this by means of a conventional filling, but it may be, because we're looking at a three-dimensional object flat and all the rest of it, um, that when we actually remove the restoration, the nerve may be exposed and we might need to do a root canal filling. Well, if that happens, it happens and you've been a good um, dentist because you've been able to anticipate that and you've explained it. If it doesn't happen, then you're an even better dentist because you've managed to avoid something that the patient certainly wasn't looking forward to. But if we don't explain that at the outset by way of a reason, then um, you know we can end up somewhat on the back foot and slightly red-faced when we actually do find there is an exposure. And it's very easy for the patient to misinterpret that and feel that we've generated that by some fault or some failing on our part. Um, so unless we explain simple things like that to patients, very obvious to us, but not necessarily to them. Great clinical records, well we would say that, wouldn't we? Um, but often it, it's your only defence. Um, when we respond to patients, I, I have what I call my hierarchy of evidence. It's great to be able to write to patients and say, my records show that, and you know, refute maybe something they've said, and even send them a copy of it. 
Um, if the records don't show that, but it was a week last Tuesday, then sometimes we can say, it's my recollection that. Um, and again, that's useful, but not necessarily the best thing. We've always got to say something. So if the records don't show anything at all, um, then we'd say, it's my custom and practice too. Um, but, you know, the good clinical records obviously are absolutely the key thing and that's particularly so if things have escalated to the GDC because the first thing they will do is um, instigate um, uh, an advisor's report which is a tabletop exercise just the records so that's key um, as we develop our practices it's important that senior staff are involved in that those who know those who've got experience um, so a team approach again to that supervision junior clinical staff junior reception staff um, so that um, it is a team approach we don't want any any breaks in that chain in dealing with patients um, it goes without saying that we're following the guidelines throughout both clinically and in terms of dealing with our complaints um, GDC requires that we work within our competence and expertise um, if we go off piece with our treatment plans then obviously and, and sometimes it's patients who drag us there um, because they're oh I'm sure you can do that I understand the limitations that you describe um, but sometimes it's easy to to um, to be persuaded to do things that we're not so sure about so be prepared to refer and be prepared prepared if things aren't going as well as we would think to sort of take a step back and reassess there's no shame in doing that patients will respect us for it and finally um, obviously it's a professional duty that we keep up to date both clinically and with all the other issues that um, that go with us so those are the the, the key points it's a whistle stop tour by necessity through um, a, a very complex and, and important area um, just got a couple of minutes um, if anyone does have any questions I know you've raised some of these questions um, as we've gone along but I'm very happy to take any any points that arise um, and obviously um, as an organization we do invite our members to contact us via our advice line um, and as and when any matters arise and we're of course delighted to address those for you okay so just before we close any final queries, any final points that have come up? Well, there we are. I think that's all sounding okay. A couple of thank yous, which is very nice. Thank you for that. Um, we very much hope that you've enjoyed this. Um, as I say, it, it will be available on our website as a resource um, if colleagues want to use it um, to sort of trigger team debates, which is what we hope it will do. Um, we hope that um, if you've enjoyed this one, you'll perhaps join us for future webinars in the future. So thank you very much for your uh, attendance and for, for joining in so, so, so gladly. Thank you.